Oh, yes, perfect. I'm recording. Hello everyone. Um, we're just we just wait for about another minute. Um, people are just logging on. Okay, um, well, thank you for joining us for um, our Center for Digital Transformation of Health's lunchtime seminar. Um, today's seminar is co-hosted by the Department of General Practice at the University of Melbourne, and this event is also endorsed for one Chia CPD point. So for those who this applies to, please retain your, your event right ticket. Um, that's proof um, of attendance. And now it's my pleasure just to introduce our speaker today, Associate Professor Joanne Mansky, um, Nenkovis. Joanne is a, an academic general practitioner at the Department of General Practice at Melbourne Medical School. Joanne leads research into the development and implementation of technology to inform decision-making in general practice and the use of data to describe and improve general practice activity with a focus on chronic disease management and antimicrobial stewardship. So today, Joanne will be presenting on data-driven quality improvement in general practice, and we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. Thanks, Joanne. Okay, thanks very much, um, Dawn, and, and thanks everybody for, for joining this today. Um, I'd like to start off by um, acknowledging that I'm giving this presentation on the lands of the Wurundjeri people, who have been custodians of this land for thousands of years 
and I acknowledge and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. I'd also like to start and acknowledge that um, given we're all working from home at the moment, even though I've tried to safeguard against it, there could be random appearances of children and puppies. And if that happens, I apologise in advance. So um, in the next 40 minutes or so, I'd like to introduce you to some data-driven quality improvement programs and research that we're conducting at the Department of General Practice here at the University of Melbourne. Data has long been a driver of quality improvement in general practice, but um, with evolving technology and increasing use of electronic medical records, um, there's exciting opportunities to optimise these quality improvement strategies. So today I'm going to start by introducing um, the place of general practice in the healthcare system and discuss the importance of general practice data, as well as some of the current policy context around its use. And then I'm going to introduce you to a couple of projects that um, we've been working on developing over the last couple of years. So the first of these is an antimicrobial stewardship program um, called Guidance GP, which we've been um, collaborating with um, the National Centre for Antimicrobial Stewardship on. And I'm also going to introduce you to uh, a program for chronic disease management in general practice, um, which includes audit and clinical decision support called Future Health Today. And this is a collaboration um, that we're doing with our colleagues at Western Health. And in both of these, really, I'm going to describe really their developmental process and how both programs are trying to engage our GPs and others working in general practice um, in their development to ensure that they are user focused. And then finally, I'm going to introduce the patron data set, uh, which is a general practice data repository at the Department of General Practice and discuss how um, this data can be used to, um, use to uh, evaluate a number of different programs, but also to think about consent and governance considerations in the um, Australian context. And finally, uh, I'd also like to acknowledge that there's um, a number of uh, people both uh, in Victoria and nationally who are really leading the charge with the development of general practice data repositories and technologies that are being developed and utilised in ge the general practice space. And some of those are um, probably attending today. And of course, I welcome a broader discussion of those programs as well as part of this session. So um, before we dive into those different research projects, it's important to understand the, the context in, in which they're all taking place. And so this is um, <clears throat> a quite common uh, diagram that's used to uh, demonstrate the place of general practice and primary medical care in the healthcare system. And it basically describes what happens over the course of um, a month in terms of people accessing healthcare. And so what you'll notice is that about 24 um, percent of people will engage with or receive primary medical care in, in any given month. In contrast, only 0.01 percent of people will receive care in a tertiary care hospital. And so really this underpins the importance of general practice in the healthcare system. And even the times where people aren't actively engaging in general practice, hopefully some of the um, education that they've learned, some of the tools that they've received, some of the support that they've um, been given will help people to be able to promote their healthy lifestyles, address some of the determinants um, of health to maintain and enhance health, and also to um, encourage and support people in self-management of their health and their health conditions. So our general practice General practice is the medical specialty that provides comprehensive, coordinated, whole person care to people across the lifespan. And on average, about 85% of Australians will visit their GP at least once a year. And pre-COVID-19, there was about 2 million people that visited um, a GP each week in Australia. To provide that care, there's around 30,000 registered um, GPs working across about 7,500 practices in Australia. And for a GP to carry out all this clinical work, they have to have a good working knowledge of around 167 problems to cover 85% of the conditions that they're seeing most frequently. So sometimes there's the kind of perception that GPs are, are doing a lot of uh, 
easy jobs like uh, dealing with people with upper respiratory tract infections and the like, when in fact it can be quite um, a complex job to do. General practice though sometimes is a little bit of a black box. And so there've been calls for whole of system general practice data sets that can be used to underpin primary care reform and to also explore the outcomes in people that are attending general practice for their care. Now, general practices um, have been very early adopters of clinical practice software tools and electronic medical uh, records. Um, indeed, this started in the 1990s, so in many ways was quite ahead of the um, hospital systems in terms of adoption of electronic medical records. And the vast majority of um, general practices have been um, completely computerised for quite some time now. But it's, it is really interesting times in Australia in regards to the use of general practice data, which is stored in all of these electronic medical records. And um, part of that is really that it's important to understand how general practice in Australia works and, and how the data that ends up in those AMRs is um, impacted. So um, most GPs that those nearly 30,000 GPs work as contractors. So that is, they work in a fee-for-service model of general practice and they're paid a percentage of the money that they earn as, as part of seeing patients. So that is, um, until recently, physically seeing um, a patient in front of them um, in a room. And what there hasn't been much of an opportunity or an investment in or payment to support is um, ongoing training in terms of informatics, uh, use of electronic medical record systems, and certainly until recently, there was no um, financial support really for um, quality improvement practice, um, quality improvement um, programs. So back in August last year, the government removed some existing practice incentive payments and replaced it with a new quality improvement practice incentive payment. And as part of that, to be eligible for the funding, which is a maximum of $50,000 a year, depending on your practice size. Um, practices provide data from the elect patient's electronic medical records to bodies called primary health networks for key areas, such as diabetes, immunisation and smoking, which are some of the, these national key performance indicators. And they also have to undertake quality improvement activities. In addition, uh, there are plans for a national primary care data asset and the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare is doing the consultation around that piece. And that's been um, a result of awareness that there's a lack of primary care data that can be used for health policy and planning. So there's a lot of data that is flowing outside of the general practices and that's of differing levels of acceptability, of course, to different stakeholders. So there's been some concerns that doctors might be, start to be benchmarked against each other and that they will um, start to be paid based on um, quality. At the same time, there's a lot of concern about the quality of data from these electronic medical records that will be used um, to inform decision making. So in terms of current programs that we have now, well, for many years, there's been different programs available um, to general practices, uh, mostly in the form of electronic tools, which extract data from electronic medical records and can be used to form lists of patients with certain conditions or medications or pathology data or combinations of those things. And they've been really useful in helping practices to understand their population. And there've been programs associated with these. So some significant ones include the Australian Primary Care Collaboratives, which uh, helped general practices to look at their data and to develop quality improvement programs and receive peer support to um, optimise their practice. And we also have programs like NPS, a Medicine Wise, which has an associated general practice data repository, um, Medicine Insight, and that data is fed back to participating GPs and they can receive education visits and resources on particular topics. But a lot of these programs are one-off. There might not necessarily be this uh, recurring audit and feedback um, over time to help uh, maintain the interest of the general practice in doing these quality improvement um, programs, but also to show them 
the uh, changes that they are achieving. Now, of course, many practices have some of these electronic tools to, to start looking at these practice, but not all of them use them. And there's a lot of different reasons for that, which include barriers like time and, and workforce. And things like in-practice quality improvement um, programs with academic detailing can be quite expensive. We've got the uh, quality data uh, issues remaining. And so there's many, many barriers um, to the use of these different programs. So we still have the fundamental problem of this gap between evidence and practice, which all these tools um, are trying to um, have an impact on and which we're striving to minimise with some of these quality improvement activities. So the big question is, how can we make the best use of our resources and go about doing these quality improvement activities and using general practice data in the most effective way? So in terms of different theoretical frameworks that can be used, we have things like uh, the knowledge to action cycle, which many of you might be familiar with. And this is a, a quite widely recognised guiding framework of knowledge translation. It's based on more than 30 planned action theories. So it consists of um, this knowledge funnel. So you can see the blue in the middle through which information becomes more refined and valid. And then we have this action cycle, which is the process by which knowledge is implemented. Now, different um, methodologies like participatory design and co-design, like um, Vicky Palmer talked about a couple of seminars ago, can be really helpful in helping to adapt knowledge to the local context, understand barriers and facilitators to knowledge use and to tailor and implement interventions that are going to work for the end users. And so these are some of the principles that we've tried to um, keep in mind as we develop our different programs of work. So um, what I'm going to do now is start to introduce you to um, how I've gone around designing some of these quality improvement programs. And then as I mentioned before, we'll finish up by talking about um, the Department of General Practices Data for Decisions program, which incorporates a general practice um, data repository. So I'm going to kick off um, with our Guidance GP project. And this is a program of work that we've been undertaking in collaboration, as I mentioned before, with NCAS, which is the National Centre for Antimicrobial Stewardship. And as a bit of um, context uh, for this program of work, in Australia, um, we have relatively high rates of community um, antibiotic use. So uh, the Aura report has ranked Australia in about the top 25% or so of countries with the highest community antibiotic use compared to um, countries in Europe and in Canada. Data from our pharmaceutical benefits scheme has suggested that around four in 10 Australians have at least one antimicrobial agent um, dispensed a year. And we know that a high proportion of these prescriptions are being issued for conditions that shouldn't typically require antibiotic therapy. These are for things um, typically like upper respiratory tract infections. And this is a real um, issue because the excessive prescription of these antibiotics can be associated with the higher likelihood of subsequent infection with multi-drug resistant pathogens the over-medicalisation of otherwise self-limiting conditions, and also the development or continuing a culture of expectation of um, antibiotics in the community that can drive inappropriate use in a cyclical fashion. In hospitals, um, there have been a number of antimicrobial stewardship programs that have been effective in helping to increase the appropriate use of antibiotics and in fact some of their audit and feedback activities form part of accreditation processes. There's also been a number of hospitals that have developed clinical decision support tools to help promote appropriate antibiotic prescribing. So high rates of antibiotic prescribing in the community plus um, some of the success of some of these hospital programs has really shone a, a light on the increased recognition of the need for antimicrobial stewardship in the general practice setting. So um, over the past uh, couple of years, uh, we've had a really um, nice team of 
GPs, infectious diseases physicians, um, health informaticians, computer scientists, um, as well as our colleagues in the primary health network starting to, to work together to develop some antimicrobial stewardship activities. And the programs consisted of a number of different stages. So we've started off with some quite simple qualitative studies on how GPs use their electronic medical record and guidelines to make antibiotic um, prescribing decisions. Uh, we've conducted manual audits um, with trained pharmacists who have gone into general practices and looked at their electronic medical records and provided feedback to GPs and educational webinars with um, peer support learning to look at um, programs that might be acceptable and helpful to GPs. And what some of that work has demonstrated is that improved um, documentation of the reason for prescription of antibiotics in the electronic medical record is really important to enable auditing. That this is perceived as a really valuable thing by our GPs to have that audit and feedback happening at a local um, level, ideally when it's um, endorsed by professional bodies that having some kind of mechanism to support these um, audit activities in an ongoing way is really important with manual methods being um, very labor intensive and that lack of access to guidelines integrated within the electronic medical record is um, a barrier to access. So that work um, has underpinned um, our current pilot project which we're running in, in three general practices in which we're moving from um, more uh, active audit with uh, trained auditors going out into to practice using paper-based tools through to passive extraction of um, data from the electronic medical record with prompts for the GP to enter the reason for prescription during audit periods so that we can look not only at the volume of antibiotic prescribing in general practice but also its compliance with guidelines and also its appropriateness in terms of treating the infections that people are presenting with in general practice. We also have undertaken a simulation um, study to explore the usability and required design features of some clinical decision support tools embedded within, within the electronic medical record that can provide access to therapeutic guidelines, which is one of our nationally endorsed guidelines and also um, patient resources. So I'll just share that um, study with you, um, which will be published soon in um, medical decision making. So um, what you'll see on your screen at the moment is an example of a general practice electronic medical record. This is one from uh, Best Practice, which is one of the two most commonly used electronic medical record systems in general practice in Australia. And um, what you can see is um, an EMR that's been made for um, a simulated patient that was used in the study, so it's not a real patient. On the screen, you can see that this is the prescribing screen where GPs um, enter a medication that they're going to prescribe to patients in general practice. And then um, you can see here our clinical decision um, support button where GPs could enter the reason for prescription um, or an indication for potential uh, antibiotic use that would generate a drop-down menu of a curated list of general practice um, indications that they could then select from. So this screen was on the prescribing screen and it was also on the main screen of the patient's electronic medical record. And when they clicked on the indication, they were taken um, straight to the relevant um, page in the guidelines and that was also linked to some patient resources that they could use in the consultation if that was relevant to them. So uh, what we did in this study is we um, developed two patient electronic medical record files and we included things like demographic information and medical history, prescriptions and pathology results. And we developed patient scripts for our simulated patients that included things like opening statements, um, key information about past history and presenting complaint and some key phrases and prompts to use in the consultation. So our first um, consultation was a 61-year-old woman who presented with a, to the clinic with recurrent symptoms of a urinary tract infection. And this was quite um, a complicated case uh, with um, adverse um, 
reactions to previous antibiotics, comorbidities, and previous documented resistance to antibiotics. So this was designed to be a complex case for which first line antibiotic therapy wouldn't be appropriate. And we would expect GPs to, to probably need to reference the guidelines. And the second was a very common presentation to general practice, which was a, a teenage girl just before year 12 exams with a sore throat coming in requesting um, antibiotics. So this condition was consistent with a viral infection that, that would not require antibiotic treatment. So the GPs uh, did both of those consultations and after that they completed some usability uh, questionnaires and also rated how realistic the consultations were. And then they participated in a modified Think Aloud interview with some additional semi-structured questions and these were thematically analysed. So this is just an example of where the, our consultations took place. This is um, the simulation laboratory that we set up in uh, what was the Network Society Institute. And basically the GP had access to all of the equipment that they would ordinarily have in a general practice consultation that they could use if needs be during the simulated consultations. So what did we find was um, important and what was some of the feedback from our participants? Well, all of the um, GPs said that the um, consultations were realistic and quite representative of consultations that they saw in general practice. And seven out of the eight um, participants um, had high satisfaction with the tool based on the post-study um, usability questionnaire and uh, also a high usability based on the system usability scale. So the key design features that the GPs identified as being important was um, having uh, access to the tool from multiple screens assisted with clinical workflow, uh, having uh, clear logos and uh, signposting of the tool. So if here we were able to use the therapeutic guidelines um, logo. So this GP said that that for them was like the Nike tick or the golden arches. So if you see it, you're going to click on it. And the other obviously key thing was that it was integrated with the within the electronic medical record. So they didn't have to open lots and lots of different um, websites to get access to the guidelines that they needed um, for the consultation. Some of the, the key themes that um, came out of the interviews was that the tool did help to assist with clinical decision making and informed appropriate prescribing in a timely manner. So it gave them information immediately on what they needed and also gave them alternatives so they were able to get the information that they needed quickly. There was a perception that it would be of increased benefits to GPs who were less experienced or not familiar with guidelines. So for example, uh, this GP said that, you know, I was taught how to use antibiotics properly, so I don't think I would need to use it. Um, whereas what we actually found in reality is that uh, this GP did prescribe um, in a way that wasn't consistent with guidelines. So um, despite that perception, there would still have likely been benefits. Um, having easy access to guidelines at the point of care was actually used to help convince patients when antibiotics were not necessary because they were able to justify their clinical decision-making with um, what the guidelines were saying to be able to demonstrate that. And lastly, having um, patient information help to provide relevant evidence-based information for patients, which could enhance communication between the GP and the patient. So for example, even uh, GPs, um, like GP5 here said, well, look, I probably don't really need the guidelines, but having the tool that also helped give me easy access to the patient resources that I could then print out and give to, to patients was helpful. And, where a um, good um, or important role was perceived. So where we're up to in that program at the moment is we're currently um, piloting it with uh, about 30 GPs uh, across three general practices in uh, Melbourne. And they've participated already in a baseline audit um, where we've passively um, extracted data from the electronic medical record uh, being uh, developed feedback reports and delivered webinars 
the clinical decision support tool, um, which is really more of a um, integration of a therapeutic guidelines button into the electronic medical records being installed. And it's been fantastic to have some um, improvement with quality improvement um, activities from our local Northwest Melbourne PHNs who've been able to help practices once they've identified issues um, based on their feedback reports to actually make changes in practice. So in August, we'll do another um, second audit and our GPs will then move towards completing their RACGP accredited quality improvement activity. And we'll be evaluating that through a validation of the um, GPNAPS um, survey and undertaking qualitative interviews and analysing quality improvement plans and look forward to the further development and scalability of that program. So um, the next one that I will move on to is Future Health Today, which is um, our program that we're developing in collaboration with our colleagues at Western Health. So chronic uh, disease obviously is a, a major issue in Australia and the rates are only continuing to increase. Um, for all Future Health Today at the moment, we're focusing on four key chronic um, conditions. So type two diabetes, uh, chronic kidney disease, cardiovascular disease and cancer. And the idea of this tool is that um, we're wanting to provide opportunities or enhanced opportunities to help um, general practice staff to identify people at risk of chronic disease, to optimise the medical management of those that have um, chronic conditions, to identify abnormal test results that might be consistent with the risk or a diagnosis of chronic disease that might require follow-up, and also to facilitate quality improvement activities to, to act on um, those people that have been identified using the using tools. So uh, we've really started working on um, this from the ground up. So uh, our co-design process started with our end users um, in about February uh, last year. And we used a service design methodology to really look at how um, people move through the general practice uh, setting and to identify opportunities where maybe uh, we could do things better. So we had a general practice panel of practice managers, uh, GPs and practice nurses who helped us on that journey, um, as well as some um, consumers. So altogether we had uh, three co-design um, meetings with general practice staff over which time we developed our prototype, Future Health Today, focusing um, initially on chronic kidney disease and then had some of our end users um, use the prototype tool in a Think Aloud um, meeting to provide us with additional feedback to optimise its development. And then we showed that to um, five people that attend general practice for their care and got their feedback about the tool and um, what it might mean for, for them. So, what that process um, showed us is that whatever tool that was created obviously had to have elements that were important to general practice that was able to, to fit within their um, workflow. So these included requirements like uh, automating patient recall, ability to track the number of patients either at risk of a chronic disease or with a chronic disease over time uh, to see how their, their treatment and their, their health was progressing. They wanted the ability for, to be flexible, really, and to, to focus on different conditions that were relevant to their individual practice profiles. They wanted um, pathology results and some biomedical markers to be displayed in formats that were um, optimised to help facilitate review. They wanted easy access to relevant guidelines, and they wanted to be able to incorporate their quality improvement activities within the platform rather than have that separate. So what did the general practice patients or consumers think? Well, they were uh, comfortable with the use of computers in face-to-face -face consultations. But if the GP was using a tool uh, during a consultation, they also wanted the ability to maybe look at it. And hence, any language that was used um, in those tools should also be easy for patients to understand. They were interested in being able to see how their health indicators were changing over time 
um, and they wanted to see that in different formats like numbers or graphs depending um, on the particular person. And interestingly, they all had a high level of trust in their current doctors, but they felt that they would have increased confidence with a doctor that wasn't their usual doctor if they accessed information such as guidelines during a consultation. And this was of particular interest because some of the doctors were worried that if a um, patient saw them using a clinical decision support tool during a consultation, that the, the patient might have a, um, negative uh, thoughts about um, that doctor and their knowledge. So as a result of um, that process and working with um, practices in the field as well, we've developed our program um, and tools. So what we have now is a system that uh, runs through um, the general practice electronic medical records at night um, and puts patients in different buckets uh, based on the algorithms that uh, the tool is running. Those patients then used to populate our dashboards um, and uh, also are marked um, to have clinical decision support activated at the point of care. So our dashboard takes a whole of practice population approach and allows proactive health planning and patient recall, while the point of care tool facilitates opportunistic care. We're bringing um, guidelines together and trying to bring them uh, and make them more accessible to general practitioners and to have some uh, uh, pre-made, so to speak, quality improvement activities that practices can um, use on the platform. Alongside this, um, we have some quality improvement support, um, ongoing input from our general practice and consumer advisory groups to make sure what we're developing meets their needs and also to underpin our research activities where we're evaluating um, or going to start evaluating um, the impact of this platform in the general practice setting. So um, to give you a little bit of an idea of what that looks like, um, this is our um, general practice uh, dashboard that we have where practices can create patients of a cohort, uh, create patient cohorts, sorry, and can also um, access the quality improvement activities. So here's an example of building a, a patient cohort so um, in this scenario, uh, we can uh, focus on chronic kidney disease and maybe create a cohort of patients that might be due, for example, to have a kidney health check done. We're then able to review those patient lists and rather than toggle between the program and the electronic medical record, uh, we can <clears throat> have a look at some uh, key medical um, summaries of information that look at those trends over time and the like, and that also um, advise the GP what the recommendations are, uh, show them why the patients have ended up um, with that recommendation, and also provide um, links direct to um, guidelines. What we can also then do is track what happens to that patient cohort over time. So we can see if they've been recalled by reception, we can see if they've got an appointment but they haven't attended yet. We can see if the actions are in progress and then we can see um, how many patients have actually had that action, in this case, a, a kidney health check um, completed. And this can help um, practice nurses be more efficient um, in uh, their chronic disease management and it can also help um, see how uh, practices are ticking along with their quality improvement activities. For that more opportunistic care, this is an example uh, again of a general practice electronic medical record. And again, this is not um, a real patient, but we can see that um, this patient here has an um, indication that they might benefit from a kidney health check. And the GP can either act on that with that level of information, but if they want to dig down, find out why that indication is there, and then also to look at that snapshot um, summary, then they're able to as well. So um, we piloted um, the first module of uh, Future Health Day, which was, as I mentioned, with chronic kidney disease um, in the second half of last year. And this year, we've got a further 12 practices who are coming on board to help us with continuing to optimise the platform, making sure it meets the requirements of a, um, a broader number of um, general practices and different types of general practices 
both in metropolitan, regional and rural Victoria. Um, next year, we'll be doing a cluster randomised controlled trial um, using the platform for chronic kidney disease and uh, cancer and continuing to expand uh, type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease as, as we go along the way. And a shameless plug that, so we do have two PhD scholarships available. So if we've got anybody interested in health informatics or cardiovascular disease interested in doing a PhD, then um, please reach out to us. Um, but it's, we are also aiming to have our platform um, in 92 general practices by 2022. And we have a really big uh, team of people uh, working on this project. Uh, once again, it's a very multidisciplinary team. But I think some of the uh, really interesting parts of this project is that we have uh, Megan Prichter and Mark Taylor, who are academic lawyers from the Helix Group at the University of Melbourne, who are really um, helping us uh, in regards to um, legal issues uh, around the use of tools like Future Health today and um, helping us to create um, robust data governance frameworks. Um, and also really importantly, all the GPs, practice nurses and practice managers who are um, helping us both piloting our tool and directing our, our research direction. And we've also, as of the beginning of this month, um, put together our ongoing consumer advisory group and we're really excited about continuing to engage with them to make sure that we're meeting their needs through this program of work as well. So it's been a very, very busy um, time for us. Pre-COVID, you can see that the team uh, were very, very busy working, not like that anymore with current social distancing, um, but it's uh, been a really um, great project and we're looking forward to seeing how Future Health Today continues to develop moving into the future. And finally, the, the last bit that I wanted to um, talk to you about today is the Department of General Practices Data for Decisions and Patron Program of Research. So um, Data for Decisions aims to make better use of existing primary care data to increase research capacity and data quality and to improve knowledge, medical education, healthcare policy and the way that medical care is delivered. And this is linked to VicREN, which is our practice-based research and education um, network. So VicREN aims to support collaborative practice-based primary care research to, that makes a difference to health outcomes and care. And we also provide opportunities for primary care providers to engage in research and access research expertise and other opportunities. And um, importantly, to also provide Department of General Practice researchers with access to the um, incredible expertise that exists um, with our general practice um, GPs, nurses and practice managers. So those of you who are interested in research in the primary care um, space, please Google VicREN um, and have a look and consider um, joining that group. So, um, the Patron Program is the name of our general practice data repository. And that is um, underpinned by Granite Software that's been developed by um, my colleague, Dougie Boyle, who's director of the Habic R Squared unit in the Department of General Practice. And this is the um, tool that's used to um, extract data from the electronic medical records of participating general practices. So uh, the data that's extracted is privacy protected before um, it leaves the practice. Uh, we exclude person identifiable data fields and um, Dougie's um, team then apply, applies additional privacy filters in areas where they know that um, user error in terms of putting in um, potentially patient identifying um, information uh, can be put into the EMR. Uh, the software itself enables opt-in, opt-out and waivers of pa patient consent. And for our page, patron data repository, uh, we have ethics approval for a waiver of patient consent, although patients are able to um, withdraw um, by discussing that with their general practice clinic and by using the tool um, that their data will not be extracted. Um, importantly, there's lots of different um, data sharing tools in general practice and, and Granite does not prevent the use of um, GPs and general practices using multiple data sharing tools and importantly doesn't slow um, computer processing, which is really important to our GPs. 
So the tech part is obviously really important, but also the attitudes of people that attend general practice for their care and also um, the GPs and other general practice staff that we're asking uh, for them to share their data with us are really, really important as well. So what I've got here is some, some of the attitudes that we've identified um, to sharing de-identified health data. Um, and this work was done by uh, Sophia Ng, who was a medical student doing her research project with us last year, and also Tim Monaghan, um, who was our academic uh, GP registrar. And some of the key things that they found by uh, Sophia um, interviewing patients that are data for decisions practice was that the patients she interviewed were broadly supportive of data from their electronic medical record being shared for the purposes of research, but were keen to know more. They were, they were happy that it was a university that was involved um, because they saw that as a mechanism to, that was more likely to be used to help others. But there were a variety of ideas on appropriate models of consent, which ranged from uh, opting consent uh, through to waivers. Interestingly, particularly um, amongst some of the younger uh, interviewees, there was uh, more of an awareness of the potential monetary value um, of, of data. And so there was, a, um, there was some thoughts about whether or not patients should be paid um, for their data to be used in this way. And some did want data sharing activities to be made more visible. Uh, Tim uh, interviewed uh, GPs, practice nurses and um, practice managers at both participating and, and non-participating practices. And once again, there was a variety of opinions on both the value of these data sets, the forms of consent and what some of the risks might be in terms of uh, data security and sharing. But once again, overall, there was enthusiasm for the potential of general practice relevant research so findings that they could actually apply to their practice. Again, um, there was a discussion about, well, data and how data might be used to make a profit, in which case they felt that they should be compensated. Um, and there was also a bit of a wariness that uh, data sharing um, might be limited if there was additional time or inconvenience that um, resulted um, to the, the general practices. So we've adopted um, as many of the best practice uh, principles for appropriate use of health data um, for research that we've been able to identify. And, and Rachel Canaway um, pulled a lot of these together in uh, her article in the MGA, MJA uh, last year about the best practice use of primary care electronic records for research. Um, and these include things like independence data governance committees deciding on who can access data. Uh, gaining public trust, um, data minimisation principles, uh, transparency, and also con community involvement in helping to fully realise the, the public benefits of data-based health research. And finally, um, the, the scope of research types and activities and advances in clinical care that be, can be facilitated by primary care data sharing is, is certainly immense. And uh, I think in Australia is yet to be fully realised. So these include things like cohort studies, use of EMR data in, um, in trials, uh, development of uh, you know, predictive models to identify people at risk of developing specific diseases or who might benefit from preventative uh, care. And as well, different types of linkage that can be used to link different general practice data repositories, hospital and other administrative data sets um, are all possibilities. So uh, with that, I, I'll wrap up. I, in conclusion, I guess, I think that it's really important to acknowledge that um, general practice is a key component of the healthcare system. And um, there's a lot of investments that are currently um, being uh, made in electronic medical record systems, for example, in hospitals, but investments are also required to help facilitate quality improvement and develop really great general practice data resources as well. There's opportunities, obviously, to optimise care and to understand general practice activity more through the use of general practice data. And it's important not just to take the data to create reports or to do studies, 
it's really important for GPs and general practices to see some results of that data sharing that's relevant for them. And so involving end users in the design of general practice interventions is really important. Um, and also to help inform ongoing development of technology to ensure that it meets their needs. And finally, um, in regards to the general practice data sets, really robust governance, security and building trust are key facilitators of um, sharing EMR data. But ongoing conversations, I think, are going to be really important around the value of data and consent. So I'd just like to finish up with some um, acknowledgements of the research team at the Department of General uh, Practice. Um, Rachel, who, hope, who, who manages our, our VicRen um, network, including our Data for Decisions program. Uh, collaborators, really importantly, our GPs, practice nurses, practice managers and consumers that participate in our advisory groups and research and makes it a lot better than it would be without them. So I'll finish there. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks for a great presentation um, and for telling us about Guidance GP Future Health today and the patron program. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left for questions. So does anyone have any pressing questions for Joanne? Uh, good morning, Dominika here, Marble University. Thank you, John. This was a really insightful uh, conversation, uh, presentation and I really uh, enjoyed learning about uh, the work you're doing, but also how this work fits together and how uh, different work packages are um, actually, you know, uh, telling us so much how data can be used in different settings. Um, I think I have a very broad question. So I would like you to elaborate a little bit more about where do you see those programs going? Do you think there is a potential to scale them across all of Australia with some refinements? Uh, what would be the ideal scenario for uh, all of those projects from now, let's say five years? Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that uh, question, Dom. Um, <clears throat> Obviously, I think that they're important and, and the, we wouldn't be doing either of those programs if we didn't have a vision for them uh, to scale and to be implemented. And that's why we've gone through the process that we've gone through. So really our, what a key piece of our work is actually is engaging with people in government, in primary health networks, you know, in general practice with those key stakeholder groups. Um, as well as consumer groups, um, they've been really important in helping us um, as well. <clears throat> and by doing that, we're hoping that we can come up with ways to, to provide these at scale. We have additional challenges given that general practices are often, you know, multiple small businesses um, mm -hmm. scattered all over Australia and so don't maybe have some of the same overarching things that maybe a hospital administration um, might offer. But um, we're really keen to, to work with um, you know, corporate general practice groups, um, RACGP, Australian Government, and look at how we can provide these at scale. And that's, that's definitely what we're working um, towards. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's a question from Daniel. Um, Joanne, could you comment on your collaboration with GP EMR vendors and how are you managing to work with them to modify their products with, C with CDSS? Yeah, so I think that um, our approach is we have been meeting with um, electronic medical record vendors and certainly if we were able to integrate some of these tools, um, you know, within their EMR, then that would be a solution that would greatly enhance scalability. So we're going to continue having those um, discussions and um, Really, it's about keeping them up to date with our progress, um, able to you know, share learnings with them about what our GPs are finding really important. And hopefully it becomes a two-way thing that we can develop something that GPs want to use and um, we can work with um, vendors who want to um, use their tools to optimise the GP experience and also optimise patient outcomes.
Thanks, Joanne. Um, I think we have time for about what, one or two more questions. Uh, Joanne, this is Wendy Chapman. Hi, Wendy. Thanks for the great work, and we're just really excited to be working with you. What what do you what have you found are the biggest barriers to success in the space, and how have you approached them? Mm. I think that um, you know, obviously at this time when health services are have been really busy with having to do rapid transitions from the usual care arrangements to telemedicine um, and the like, uh, you know. For us, it's about continuing to um, ensure that what we're developing is going to be of use to them and being able to be really nimble. So um, we're ex I would say that um, one of the facilitators, if I twist that around a little bit, is that we're really lucky to have um, a technical team embedded within our department that can be really responsive to the feedback that general practices provide us. So that means that um, rather than having to, you know, um, wait several months to fit in with a work plan, you know, if something really important happens for general practice, then we're able to really work closely with that, that tech team to make those changes. And I think that that's been uh, really important. And I think that um, that, that relationship with uh, practices being able to feel that they're part of the project is, is key. It's really important. And we've certainly had some feedback about, oh, you know, we don't want to be told what to do by, by people who don't understand the environment in which we're practicing. So the fact that there's GP researchers that are actively being really inclusive of the um, important feedback that we're getting from our participants and and really understanding what their work is like has been really uh, important. We have a question from Rezik. Um, the priority of the clinic of the physician physician is on patient encounter rather than capturing the data. How would they manage it? Yeah, so I think that's a really good comment. And the thing that we always remember is that the EMRs kind of being created to help with clinical care. It hasn't been created primarily with the thoughts of research or policy or, or planning. And so I think that actually it's upon um, us to work out ways of better dealing with that data than expecting people to have to change what they're doing in their clinical practice and creating more burden for them by expecting them to, to do more and more uh, recording just because it's good for us. So I think that that's where coming up with some um, uh, you know, new methodology, uh, our statisticians helping us about the best way to deal with miss, missing data, um, maybe using techniques like natural language processing that can also look at the free text notes and not just coded diagnoses. Those are all things that I think that we need to work on as a research and informatics community um, so that the people in the practices can concentrate on doing their job, which is to help their patients. Yeah, it's a, it's a very fine balance between trying to manage clinical workflow and also putting forward research priorities. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Well, if, if, um, if everyone has um, they questions answered. Um, thank you so much, Joanne, for, for your talk again today. That was fantastic. Um, well, stay tuned, everyone, for our, our seminar series, which is coming up next month in June. So we'll be sending out more communications about that soon. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks, everyone. See ya.